So finally, sexuality that comes out of a deeper part of your being, that's what's called Tantra. Because then the sexual energies keep liberating and moving energy and opening up and tuning you to greater and greater energies and bringing you deeper into the oneness. The one involves its dance of the two, and through this process of magnetism and the two, it keeps liberating energy back into the one. So it's the dance of two to one to two to one to two to one, and that's the dance of sexual energy. Welcome, everyone, to another Ramdas Here and Now episode. I'm Jackie Dabrinska, your host, and you. You are the Ram Das community, this group of folks from all over the world that have this thread of connection to Ram Das and these teachings. Thanks for being here. Today, we dive into episode 222, the dance of sexual energy. It's a Q&A session. I think it's from the 1980s. And in it, Ram Das talks about so many things that are unknowable from the rational mind, from this plane. We want to know them. We want to think we know them. But really, there is a layer of unknowing. It's things like disembodied beings, uh, the possibility of some world order. Trigger warning here. uh, Incredible violence and horror. Dark nights of the soul. God's death. Our divine self. Maybe that one's a little knowable. Um, And the dynamics of relationships, which for me is one of the more unknowable things. Um, At the end of this episode, he talks about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And if you don't know it, it's sort of a guidebook that tells us how to achieve liberation in the moment of death and fulfill our potential as spiritually awakened beings, as Buddhas. So uh, a few years ago, a My best friend passed and uh, a few of us read it for the 49 days after her death. And each day it sort of talks about some like soft glowing light over there that you're not supposed to go to because it pulls you away from the true essence of who you are. At least that's how I understand it. I could be totally wrong. That was my interpretation. But when I look at our culture and all of the songs and my friends and my past experiences, I often think of relationships as sort of having their own bardos, all the ways that our desire to be loved from the outside, which is normal. And like, there's just, we're wired for connection, right? But this like hunger um, and deprivation model, how it keeps us away from our own true essence of love that like, that beingness that we are. And maybe I'm stuck a little bit in last week's um, episode or the last episode of this being a blessing in the world. But um, just this idea to come from this abiding love and compassion that's sourced from the very fabric of our being. Um, Not in a holy phony sort of way, but in a really authentic, like knowing that part of ourselves And I think that's sort of what's needed in the face of most of the questions that are coming from our mind. And it makes me wonder, like, how would it change my life? How would it change our lives to really live from that place more, to sort of have faith in it? Which brings up another part of this talk where he talks about living with more lightness and joy and more focus on the sweetness of it all. And I know I can get really deep into like the doing and the achieving and like my pitta mind. And when I can like back up into the sweetness of life, everything's just lovely. Um, Some friends of mine are doing a one year to live program this year, which asks you to live as if this was your last year um, in this incarnation. And so I wake up with that question. And it does make me want to spend a little bit more time with the daisies and wearing sparkles and just loving everyone and being with what is. Um, And I wonder how that would change our lives to to wake up with that question. (laughs) There are so many questions, so many opportunities to awaken. And you all get a chance to discuss these as a community. Uh, We have some fun opportunities coming up in the fellowship. So make sure you are registered. Um, Go to ramdas.org slash fellowship. And 
If you want to hang out with more folks with their hearts and compasses pointed towards truth, make sure you check out the upcoming second annual Ramdas Legacy Summer Mountain Retreat. It's in Boone, North Carolina at the Art of Living Retreat Center this coming August. It's going to include Krishna Das and Dr. Sarah King, Lama Sultram Alioni, um, East Forest, Nina Rao, and many, many other amazing wisdom keepers. So you can get more information about that at ramdas.org slash boon. And boon is spelled with an E on the end of it. B-O-O-N-E. So as always, whatever good may come from these teachings, may it benefit all of us in our daily lives and ripple out into the world for all beings. We thank the many, many people that made this possible from Ram Das and Maharaji to the sound guys on the back end of this, to our sponsors, to all of you for tuning in and to all of you who donate so that we can keep doing this. And please, if you don't already, consider donating at ramdas.org slash donate. So here is Ramdas here and now. Namaste and blessings. Okay. Uh, Questions and answers. Uh, Let me explain that I am like the wise man in Thurber's 13 Clocks who said I am under a curse and 50% of the time I'm wrong and I don't know which 50% it is. Because everything I say sounds like truth to me. Because obviously it would, since I said it. But you listen, and some of them are coming through loud and clear, and some of them are just my own, you know, stuff. So trust your own heart, and if it doesn't feel good, just run it through like Chinese food, and don't worry about it, okay? And if it feels good, use it. It's okay. Okay. And you can ask anything. Just raise your hands, and I'll... uh, Yes. What I speak about Nostradamus predictions, specifically things, the gloomy ones. Um, (sighs) These are what are called astral scenarios. And you can buy, there are a lot of them going at the moment. There's the American Indian one, and there's Nostradamus, and there's lots of them. There's dozens of them around. You can see these as the birth pangs of the new age. Or you can see it as the last screaming cries of the darkness. Just before the living envy the dead. There are a tremendous number of scenarios. And my feeling as I've been asked about scenarios for so many years, I thought finally about what difference does it make to me whether the world will end in a moment or in a billion years, what am I going to do now? And I realized that whichever scenario was right, the only thing I could do now was quiet my mind, open my heart, and act in a way to relieve suffering. That's all I could do. And then whatever would happen would happen. And I would do that whether the world were going to end in one minute or we're going to end in a billion years. In other words, each of us is working on ourselves, doing what we have to do from day to day in order to fulfill our karma, in order to honor our incarnations. And the way we're doing it is by making ourselves, we can't wait till we're enlightened to act because action is part of our incarnation. So you act with whatever purity you've got, but you act in a way where you're working on yourself to make yourself more and more pure so that your actions are more and more those which liberate people rather than entrap them. And you're doing that about your relationships, about nuclear energy, about everything. About everything. You work on yourself. So I really don't know about any of these things. I'm not privy to the secrets of the court. Questions? Yes. Is, um, is Emmanuel a projection of, it would be a projection of Pat's intuition, because she's the one that talks to Emmanuel. I just hear what Pat says, Emmanuel said. I don't talk to Emmanuel directly. Now, is, is Emmanuel real 
real or is he a part of Pat real? I don't know. I don't even care. All I know is he's groovy to hang out with, right? I, I couldn't. I don't care. I don't really care. I don't know. I don't know. And the Jungian analysis was great. You know, at first I thought, well, I'll help the analyst, you know. <laughs> but it turned out, it, it, I came to that in a funny way because people say, you getting an analyst, you know, you in therapy? My goodness. Um, I have a friend, Danny Goleman, and Danny's a juggernaut das. He's an old guru brother of mine from India, old student of mine from Harvard, actually, way back. And uh, he's also now editor of Psychology Today. He's one of the senior editors. And a few years ago, his marriage kind of went to hell, and he said, I met him one day, and I, he said, um, I've gone into therapy. And he's written books on Buddhist meditation and so on. I said, what are you doing in therapy? Like, why would you do a thing like that? I mean, I was a therapist for years, and, you know, I thought I graduated. <laughs> so he said, well, I'm... I thought, oh, poor Danny, you know, he's read too many of his magazines. About a year later, I met Danny. I kept meeting Danny, but Danny kept getting more radiant all the time. I said, Danny, why are you so radiant? He said, it was therapy. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, you think it would be useful for me? He said, yes. I mean, I, I wish he had delayed just a little bit, you know, but there was no delay. It was immediate, you know. So that was about three years ago, and I kind of put it into my craw and just sort of, I didn't want to digest it just yet. And, then this winter, when I was sitting there screaming with jealous rage and anger and all that stuff, I thought, this must be the time for the therapy. <laughs> so I found a, you know, a therapist by chance who turned out to be somebody I had known in the 60s who knew me as Dick. And so I walked and he said, hello, Dick, come on and sit down. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's like body and fender repair work. I mean, uh, part of it is um, just totally delightful. It was interesting because I was in psychoanalysis 25 years ago when I was, you know, in the institute and training and stuff like that. And um, in those days, the analyst was this kind of, all kind of, I was so filled with the melodrama of my personality. But now there's another realm of my being that's very developed. And so I experienced the analyst as a, Really beautiful guy with a model that is very helpful to me in working on stuff. And we seem like good friends. And there was no resistance. I wasn't fighting against something. And it just opened and opened and opened. And very shortly, I found myself at that moment in my earliest childhood, just without any techniques, just went there, where the act of doing something that somehow broke me away from the totality of what is, and what it left me with, of that I didn't really have a right to exist. And I started going around saying, I have a right to exist. I have a right to exist. Everybody I've met for about a week, I have a right to exist. You know, it was like Dick Alpert screaming, I have a right to exist. And so this tour is interesting because this is a tour in which Dick Alpert is having his right to exist. And it's turning out that who I am isn't Ram Dass, and it isn't Dick Alpert. It's something much more interesting than any of that. These are all just vehicles that are useful for me to get it all together. Questions? Do you have anything to share about, about having my beard off? Uh, it was whimsy, um, but um, I had it for 14 years. And it was all white, and people treat people with white beards a certain way, and I really didn't want to be that person. You know, I was busy having a love affair with a, somebody in their 20s, and it just felt absurd. So um, I took off the beard, and then uh, that was funny because um, my father had a little um, herpes, and he had this itching in his neck. So as a result, he couldn't shave. Um, and my father's this conservative Bostonian, always shaven with tie and jacket to go to the bathroom, you know. And here he was with a beard and me without the beard, and we just giggled. I mean, it was just so bizarre. I just wait long enough and it all comes around. <laughs> Questions? Earlier, you touched uh, briefly on operating creative uh, sexual... On what kind of sexual activities? <laughs> Proper ones? 
I didn't get your word. Well, there are some very, very strong desires in us, like survival. That's why death is such an interesting one, because that's the strongest one. That's the first chakra one. That's why it's such a heavy drama. And right after that comes sex, because that's the way the species reproduces. So it's really in this strong. Now, uh, you, there are these desires, these drives, these um, endocrinological manifestations in which we impose these incredible psychological fantasies. And lust is getting somebody to live out your fantasy. I don't care who you are, just put on the black stockings, you know, it's that, it's that kind of thing. It's treating another person as an object to be manipulated to live out your fantasy. And your frustration and anger is when the world, when God doesn't play according to your fantasy. You say, what's wrong with you, God, that you didn't play this one? Now, um, each of these desire systems is so strong that it has a whole reality around it, a whole perceptual reality. So when you're in it, you can feel how you're going along being full of compassion and kindness, and then you see somebody and they awaken that thing in you and suddenly you've turned into somebody else. And you're all one-pointed. No. And the, it, it possesses, it's like a possession. Now, as you start to awaken more, or get more rooted in that part which isn't caught in that place. Every time you come back into that caughtness, you, it's like diving from air into water. You feel like you've gone into a thicker substance, into a slower vibratory rate. You feel a kind of a heaviness in your being. You know that you feel like you're one-pointed in your desire system, but you realize that it's thick somehow. It's not spacious and playful and light. It's needful and graspy type. And after a while, you start to experience that as you come up for air and then as you start to go down into that thicker stuff, just the feeling of that thickness starts a mechanism going in you of correcting, of getting that other spaciousness present. Now, the kind of sexuality that liberates is that which comes with the spaciousness, where the sexuality follows from the shared awareness. Let me talk about relationships for just a second. I do marriages, sort of under the counter. I mean, I'm not a legitimate marrier. Or I used to do it, I've stopped doing it. Okay. <laughs> but at any rate, when I did marry, a couple came to me and they said, would you marry, or would you perform a marriage ceremony? And I said, well, I only marry people that understand that they are coming together in order to come to God. Oh, we understand that. That means you're coming together, so the two, your oneness is at this point more important than your two-ness. Yes, we know. I said, well, that requires truth. Oh, of course. Truth's very scary. Oh, I know, but I, I'm, I'm ready. I want truth. You sure you want truth? Oh, yes, I absolutely want truth. Both of you? Yes. Okay. So I said, would you face each other? And I said to him, if there's something you can't tell her, tell her. You hear that one? If there's anything you can't tell her, would you tell her? And there was this silence. It's our first experiment in truth. Finally, he says to her, well, after you and I agreed we wouldn't see anybody else. One day I was over at Sally's and one thing led to another. And we had oral sex. You what? <laughs> she who just a moment ago said she wanted truth. She became, I've never seen anybody do the role of a woman betrayed better. <laughs> I mean, I laid down on my back to fully appreciate the, <laughs> the magnitude. She, I mean, if I were casting for the Shakespeare Festival, she'd get it anytime. She was good. She had lines I'd never even thought of. And after about 10 minutes, I said to her, well, here's your predicament. I said, you came to me to get married, and obviously new things have arisen. And I said, you have a choice of three things. 
that I can see. One is you could get rid of the rat. I mean, he is clearly undependable. He can't be trusted. He probably will do the same thing again. And you want to hang out with somebody like that? I'd get rid of him. I'll back you all the way. You can get rid of the louse. That's one option. The section, second auction option is you could say, well, I'll try to forget about Sally. That's a good one. 20 years from now, you can say, you won't visit my mother and I've been trying to forget about Sally. You know, you can use it. You can milk it for a whole years and years and years. That's righteousness. I'm trying to get rid of Or you can say, well, here goes. I know you're a rat and you're human and that's what it is. Okay. Hold on tightly, let go lightly, and we go. And they're now married, and they got a couple of kids, and they probably lied or like rugs to each other. I don't know. But now, what I'm trying to say to you is a relationship has to get to the point where you can be in the midst of, I hate you, and you can look across and you can say, are you here? I'm here. Pretty heavy, isn't it? Yeah. It's like... It's like having the, 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 the truth of your humanity, but at the same moment, you also have the little bit of space that appreciates that you're just really lost in the game. But you've got that little thread, and it's just like a teeny thread. Sometimes you only have one little teeny thread of consciousness in the middle of a raging sea of desires and fears and paranoia and all that. That's it. That's all you need, just that little thread. And then the thread gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So when you are sharing that one, then you out of that comes the dance of two. And if it is in the way of things that there be a sexual intimacy, that's the way of things. And if not, it would seem irrelevant, even though you might have the desire. You just wouldn't manifest because in some way the other person isn't in the place of oneness about it or that your act is going to create more suffering in that person, or you can feel that the act isn't in harmony with the way of things. That's what the issue of adultery is about. I mean, if somebody else is going to be hurt, then you've got to be conscious about all that too. So finally, sexuality that comes out of a deeper part of your being, that's what's called tantra, because then the sexual energies keep liberating and moving energy and opening up and tuning you to greater and greater energies and bringing you deeper into the oneness. The one involves its dance of the two, and through this process of magnetism and the two, it keeps liberating energy back into the one. So it's the dance of two to one to two to one to two to one, and that's the dance of sexual energy. Questions? I'm going to give shorter answers. Yes. Do I believe in Illuminati that controls the universe from behind the scenes using occult powers? World events. Uh, I don't experience... That's, uh, again, an astral melodrama. I experience behind that that all of it is uh, lawfully related one to another. And there's no, it's not Sam, it's us. It's our collective consciousness that does it. That is what world events are. They are our collective consciousness. And so we are creating them. And there is one of us, so it is an Illuminati. And it is behind the scenes, because most of the time we're caught in the scenes. See, so it is that, but it isn't. It doesn't have the paranoid twist to it that that kind of a question suggests of how am I going to change him or her, you know, that rascal collie. Uh, huh. Questions? Yes. Yeah. You want it read? You want it read? Yeah. This is a letter that I wrote, I wrote to a, um, a couple whose 11-year-old daughter met her girlfriend at Hebrew school, and one day the two girls went out to play tennis, and they were both uh, raped and murdered. And um, I heard that the family was in that situation, and uh, so I wrote them a letter, which is right here. These I got for... <coughs> Twelve dollars at the drugstore. I think that's why they, they kind of. These were the only model they had. <clears throat> 
Steve and Anita, that's the mother and father, and the daughter's name is Rachel. Rachel finished her brief work on Earth and left the stage in a manner that leaves those of us left behind with a cry of agony in our hearts as the fragile thread of our faith is dealt with so violently. Is anyone strong enough to stay conscious through such teachings as you are receiving? Probably very few. And even they would only have a whisper of equanimity and spacious peace midst the screaming trumpets of their rage, grief, horror, and desolation. I cannot assuage your pain with any words, nor should I, for your pain is Rachel's legacy to you. Not that she or I would inflict such pain by choice, but there it is, and it must burn its purifying way to completion. You may emerge from this ordeal more dead than alive, and then you will understand why the greatest saints, for whom every human being is their child, shoulder an unbearable pain and are called the living dead. For something within you dies when you bear the unbearable. And it is only in that dark night of the soul that you are prepared to see as God sees and to love as God loves. Now is the time to let your grief find expression, no false strength. Now is the time to sit quietly and speak to Rachel and thank her for being with you these few years and encourage her to go on with her work, knowing that you will grow in compassion and wisdom from this experience. In my heart, I know that you and she will meet again and again and recognize the many ways in which you have known each other and when you meet, you will in a flash know what now it is not given to you to know, why this had to be the way it was. Your rational mind can never understand what has happened. But your heart, if you can keep it open to God, will find its own intuitive way. Rachel came through you to do her work on earth, which included her manner of death. Now her soul is free, and the love that you can share with her is invulnerable to the winds of changing time and space. In that deep love, include me too. While I'm reading things, I got so many goodies in there, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> this is a warning written by a woman named Jenny Joseph. When I am an old woman, I shall wear purple with a red hat which doesn't go and doesn't suit me. And I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves and satin sandals and say, we've no money for butter. I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells and run my stick along the public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick flowers in other people's gardens and learn to spit you can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausage at a go or only bread and pickle for a week and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. 
But now we must have clothes to keep us dry and pay the rent and not swear in the street and set a good example for the children. We must have friends to dinner and read the papers. But maybe I ought to practice a little now. <laughs> so people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I'm old and start to wear purple. And this other one, I could go, these go together. This one I published in uh, books. It's by Nadine Stair, and she's 85 years old, Louisville, Kentucky. I gave an, a lecture called Straight Talk About Aging and Dying in Miami Beach uh, with half price to senior citizens. <laughs> it was a great experience, because it's like being with the elders of the tribe. And it's interesting, the shift in the cultural perspective. You know that by the year 2000, one quarter of the population will be over 65, and by the year 2040, half of it will be, because of the baby boom and all that. So it's interesting. I mean, the gray panthers are really, it's a new power. This is, pretty soon all buses will have low steps and sidewalks low, because look who's running the scene. And it's interesting, the culture is changing from seeing old people as sort of cast-off type thing. We're going from being a hunting tribe to being a gathering tribe where we start to honor our elders. And it's not that we're doing it. The elders are just starting to honor themselves. Nobody, the elders were waiting for everybody to honor them. And finally they said, screw that. You know, we're just going <laughs> to become who we are. And that's what's beautiful about it. The elders are just doing it. They're becoming elders. They're accepting their responsibility for the trip. Nadine says, if I had my life to live over, I'd like to make more mistakes next time. I'd relax. I'd limber up. I'd be sillier than I would have been this trip, than I have been this trip. I'd take fewer things seriously. I'd take more chances. I'd climb more mountains and swim more rivers. I'd eat more ice cream and less beans. I would perhaps have more troubles, but I'd have fewer imaginary ones. You see, I'm one of these people who live sensibly and sanely hour after hour, day after day. Oh, I've had my moments, and if I had it to do over again, I'd have more of them. In fact, I try to have nothing else, just moments, one after another, instead of living so many years ahead of each day. I've been one of those persons who never goes anywhere without a thermometer, a hot water bottle, a raincoat, and a parachute. <laughs> if I had it to do over again, I would travel lighter than I have. If I had my life to live over, I'd start barefoot earlier in the spring and stay that way later in the fall. I'd go to more dances. I'd ride more merry-go-rounds. I'd pick more daisies. Aren't these nice? <laughs> Questions? Hanuman. Hanuman is a monkey. <coughs> Hanuman is, um, the story of Hanuman is recounted in a book called the Ramayana, which is a Bible to millions of uh, Hindus. And it's the story of uh, when God takes the form of Ram, and um, he has a wife named Sita, and he's a perfect son, he's a perfect husband, he's a perfect everything. And at one point in the story, Ram's wife is stolen away by a bad guy who's greedy to have God's Shakti. Named, the bad guy's named Ravana. And Ram, being human and a husband, is beside himself with grief. And he enlists the aid of the monkeys and the bears to help him regain Sita. And Hanuman is the monkey who finally is able to bring about this through his devotion to Ram. He is so devoted to God that he becomes known as the breath of Ram. He is the, he's got the power of God because he has, as Gandhi says, your power becomes invincible when you have reduced yourself to zero. In the Bible it says, not my but thy will. That he became so totally just an instrument of God, that it's like Christ said, had ye but faith, ye could move mountains. It was just that point. 
And in fact, at one point, Hanuman, Ram's brother, is hurt in battle, and it's going to be, he's going to be saved by an herb on a mountain up in the Himalayas. And they send Hanuman, and Hanuman leaps to the mountain, and he can't find the herb, so he rips the whole mountain and brings it back so they can find the herb. He actually did. Hedgy but faith, you could move mountains, and it's far out that in this book written 2,000 years before that, there he was doing it. So he is an instrument of service to God, and he's a complete rascal. He breaks boughs, he does what monkeys do. And so he's the monkey part of us, but he's also the divine part of us, and he's that merging of the two of them. And my name, Ram Das, means servant of God, which is a name for Hanuman. And that is a lineage, it's a sect of Hanuman, of service as a vehicle to merging into God. And Hanuman is that which becomes one with God through service, or gets as close to oneness as you can get, and still be a server. Question back there. Uh, when I work with dying people, do I use visualizations and meditations? Uh, she works with hospice. We have a new book out called Who Dies that Stephen Levine has written, who's the head of the Dying Project, and it's put out by Doubleday. And in that are a series of visualization meditations for pain and a whole set of things that we've been working with. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. We don't have any rules. We play it by ear, we wing it. We live with each human being as they go. We are a very, our project is different than hospice, by the way. Hospice is primarily a psychological support system. And the fact that you may be bringing very profound, tr uh, transcendent spiritual things to bear in it is you doing that. But the hospice basically is a psychological support system. And uh, our work is much like the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It says dying is just an illusion. You've got to do it, but we don't have to get lost in it. So we invite people to come and die with us who want to awaken through the dying process. Okay. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.